So what was the comment? Well, the, the comment was it's, he was offended by the idea that I would put Buddhist meditation, which is an Eastern tradition in the same context as Western meditation. And I said, well, I'm sorry, you're just ignorant. <laughs> well, it's it's kind of like where it all started. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh, I, lo I love an angry Buddhist. I love an angry Buddhist. It's a <laughs> beautiful no, thing. No, but was the guy who made the comment a Buddhist? No, no, no. He, he's he, he says, you know, Jung didn't, you know, didn't think that we should mix East and West. And I said, man, you really don't know Buddhism, or you don't know Jung or Buddhism. Well, you know, and that's keeping things very dualistic. Yes, oh, mm -hmm. great. I love this conversation already. Mix and blend, that's my speciality, so. <laughs> okay, well, good. Uh, Tamara, would you please, please pronounce your first name? Because I never know when to where to put the emphasis on the name, but you would know, so please tell me. Yes, in the middle, Tamara. Tamara, Tamara. okay, Tamara. But okay. I'm, I'm really, uh, okay, if you don't remember, it's fine, but I, I call, I say Tamara, but I grew up in Canada where I was also called Tamara. Um, yeah, why? Well, so my, my British pronunciation is Tamara, yeah. Well, I like Tamara because it, it more emphasizes the Mara, which, uh, of course, is an Eastern idea. So <laughs> so now I know. It's Mara. Embracing I probably, Mara. I, I've got I, the Tam and I've got the Mara. <laughs> yeah, I probably haven't. Uh, I haven't cracked yeah. it entirely, but uh, it's, it's interesting. And, Love uh, your background, Skip. Yeah, this is the same as Jerome is using, I think. But I, I like the color image better. I tried to get Lake Maggiore on here, but unfortunately that failed. <laughs> well, it's got a real sense of masculine and feminine combined. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Um, but maybe I'll get an image of Aranos here at some point. Uh, although I like Bollinger, and that's, that's a good one because that was Dr. Jung's confession of faith, right? And I finally think I understand what that means, Nancy. And so let me try this out on you, okay? So Dr. Jung was confessing his, by building this structure, he was, he was confessing his faith in the instinctual and in the creative. Um, and so he was, it was built in four sections over 16 years. Uh, so that's a, two quaternities, right? And each time he, he was moved to make a certain uh, addition to it. So it represented the, the development of his personal psychology also. And so the, the first level was like an, the first part, which was round and like an African hut was his pr more primitive level of psychology. And he gradually got up to the tower, <laughs> uh, which was a later uh, addition. And, uh, the only thing I would add is body the animal right body. well it was the combination of his body and creating a, a a logos thing obviously a house is a logos thing that's a skeleton but it's it's his confession confession of faith that life would be in it oh well that's very interesting right because logos nothing in logos is alive only Eros is alive. I just point out the body because we tend to, since we talk about psyche so much, but we don't tend to mention body, but it's through the body that the psyche expresses 
And right. so there, there is a oneness there. We don't give the body enough credit. Well, that's why, that's why Tamara is here today. Oh, good, Tamara. <laughs> Hooray. Yeah. yeah, hi, Tim, and, and hi, Nancy. It's, it's great to see you. I mean, I, I feel like familiar friends and faces, actually, because I've been watching and following the, the channel and, and really being inspired by it and the conversations and, and the work. I think it's kind of Skip and, and Tim maybe leading the work, but I understand that there's others around as well that are, that are there and, you know, fantastic to have this opportunity to dialogue. I'm, I'm really, really happy and excited to be here. So just oh, good. trying to manage yeah, that. Good. Yeah. <laughs> so tomorrow, where are you located? Well, right now I'm in the UK. Uh, normally I'm based in London, but I actually had left London a little bit for a little bit before we went into lockdown to to um, be with a family member. Um, but right now I'm near Aylesbury, so that's kind of inside the triangle of Oxford, Cambridge, and, and London in the Midlands. Oh. Yeah, uh, okay. uh, doing what Skip was just alluding to, actually creating a, a physical space where logos and eros can come together and. <laughs> and create healing environments. So yes, I'm at a kind of a, a farmhouse, a dilapidated farmhouse that there may be some people moving around in the background, like doing weeding and chopping and things because we're preparing a space here. Yeah. Well, that sounds great. I love that part of the country. <laughs> I mean, it's beautiful here. It's yes. just incredible. Yeah, really nice and uh, fresh air and the spring is really, coming strong here well remembering the body i i just would invite you a process i use because i'm on zoom all the time is to to take a moment to ensure that the body is in the most comfortable position for this yeah. for yeah. this and i'm just really bringing shoulder rolls to everybody at the moment because oh, that's a good idea the neck and the shoulders holding our holding our pain holding our emotions and really getting challenged in this new working environment. So right. um, just if there's something that can make you more comfortable, maybe we have just a few moments to do that. It's helpful. Yes. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm closely in contact with, with Brazil and um, really interested to, to connect to that. Um, but maybe I mentioned a bit of that, that connection as well. When we start. If anybody else has, people that you'd like to invite to be a featured guest, please speak up. I mean, I, I have a, a stack of them, okay, because I've been doing international business for, well, actually in business for 40 years. And in, I started in high school in 1962. So I have a lot of relations around the world <laughs> at, at all kinds of different levels. So I can call on them, but I don't want to hog the the task or you know the ability to introduce somebody. This is this session is to feature tomorrow. So and, oh yes, that's kind of nice. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we'll, we'll pull that up in in due course. Okay, one of them's this one. Oh yes. <laughs> okay, and then. Uh, Yes. Okay, and then one, the third one is this one. Okay. Opa. Yes. yes. Okay, so we'll, we'll come back and refer to those when you're ready and you want to show them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay no All right, so yeah. you, you have the floor. Okay, well, I mean, first of all, just thank you so much for this opportunity. And uh, as I was saying to uh, Nancy, it feels like some familiar faces because I've been connected to the channel for some time now and, you know, started off maybe like others just listening uh, and then having a go at interacting. Um, and now, you know, really kind of happy and excited to be connected to this community because I've been... I've been listening, I've been learning, I've been reflecting and, you know, absolutely there's been a synchronicity around some of my own personal development and, you know, access to some of the teachings of Jung 
in a way that also suits my particular learning style, which is listening. Um, so I'm here in the UK. Um, my personal story is I, I have a mixed cultural heritage, Canadian and British. Um, so I'm often accused of being not full British <laughs> because I have a particular kind of style that mixes and blends. Um, and that really is also a, a mirror and a parallel to my own personal journey, which includes my professional journey. So, you know, in brief, I have uh, a kind of mixed pathway, let's say. Uh, my early training was in experimental psychology. Uh, I was particularly interested in theory of mind, which is the capacity to hold in mind the mental representations of other people. And my work was looking at how psychosis and different aspects of the psychotic experience and non-ordinary states impact on our capacity to both hold others' thoughts in mind, the kind of cognitive theory of mind stuff, but also holding in mind people's affective states, their emotional states, their desires and, and their could, intentions. Could you define psychotic state and also address whether there are short periods of psychosis and, and longer periods, if you would. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of my observations over my career is that the language is changing. And I think that's kind of a pivotal thing. So back in the day, it was called schizophrenia. <laughs> you know, you would be seeing schizophrenics. Um, and I wrote this language in the papers that I was publishing. But now with a more mature and nuanced view, recognizing that this language is perhaps not helpful or kind. Um, so now I've sort of graduated a bit more to the language of psychosis, which for me means any mental state where there is some sort of disconnect, maybe between the kind of experience of the five senses here and now uh, in, this, in this kind of concrete world in front of us. Um, as compared to where the mind can go uh, when it's not in the body or when it's not fully connected to the body. And some of that change in language has been the result of, of my own development through clinical psychology, exploring transpersonal psychology, and opening to the concept of spiritual emergency as maybe a category of what happens in some psychotic experiences or a variant of what might be happening for some people in those experiences. Now, you know, in the, in the, in the traditional kind of clinical psychology world, which is quite aligned to psychiatry and the medical model, um, you know, we, we would define psychosis as a, as a disconnection from reality associated with things like delusions, hallucinations, hearing voices, um, maybe having sort of anomalous sensations in the body. Um, these could be short-term, maybe perhaps drug-induced. That's often a, a, many of the clients that I might see were people that had drug-induced psychosis, which often is relatively recoverable from. Um, but often it is a, a result of trauma. And I suppose what really struck me when I was doing my clinical training was the amount of trauma and particularly sexual abuse in the clients that were diagnosed with schizophrenia um, as, as it was then called or as it still is called in the in the medical model um, and this combined with my observation of how you know the medication can be helpful but also can be extremely harming for people really led me to be curious about how we might work differently with with these with these clients with these patients um, and with people experiencing these states so i've made this sort of transition almost from a quite hardcore materialistic position you know studying i did a neuroscience masters at the institute of psychiatry sort of as a bastion of the medical model of, of psychiatry of you know they do have psychology there as well and Jeffrey Gray was a mentor of mine. His, his book on creeping up on the hard problem of consciousness um, was, was a pivotal piece of research, a pivotal piece of contribution to the science of consciousness in my view. But it's a, a quite a materialistic view. 
um, and then slowly, slowly transforming, transmuting into a much broader biopsychosocial spiritual model of what's happening in these experiences. And that's what took me into contact with the transpersonal work, uh, with the more kind of Jungian approach, um, and including some of the work that I'm in contact with in Brazil with a, a particular psychiatrist who's very affiliated to Nissa de Silveira, um, uh -huh. uh, somebody who worked with Jung or who, who collaborated, who dialogued with Jung, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, before you go too much further, I certainly want to talk with you about the transpersonal, but I, I just want to clarify a couple of things. Uh, one is... Um, there still is, is there not, a diagnosis of schizophrenia? But isn't I mean, that more you know, of a psychiatric diagnosis than a, than a psychological diagnosis? So in other words, a mental disease or defect that might be treated by pharmaceuticals and is probably not going to be responsive to, to psychological approaches per se. Is that, is that right? Or? Well, I mean, I, my, my training is as a psychologist. So, I mean, I think a, a psychiatrist might answer this okay, question. Okay, in fairness, I should, I should tell you also that Joss, who's the big J on our screen, but who is uh, currently at 524 in the morning, Honolulu time, is a psychiatrist. Okay, so just so you know. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, and again, with healthy debate is, is, is how we mature and how we grow and evolve. And uh, I guess I'm, you know, I'm pointing to my own journey as well, because it's been evolving. Mm -hmm. And uh, I look back at, at maybe some of my language and concepts and understanding. And, you know, I, I feel happy that I'm evolving. And I think the story is still evolving. Um, right. You know, absolutely. I think there's many patients that require medication, are very helped by medication. And, you know, for a variety of reasons, including opportunity, uh, they, they, they are not accessing other ways of healing. Mm -hmm. You know, at the other end of the spectrum, I mean, I don't believe that every person with a psychotic experience is a shaman. This is kind of where things have taken a bit of a wrong turn, in my view, as well, in our mm -hmm. modern society. Right. But I think there's somewhere in between. Uh, and I'm a big fan of giving people choice. Um, yeah. and, and even if it looks like something that it's difficult to treat as a psychologist, my work was about how can we work with people that can't sit still and aren't in their bodies and struggle to communicate um, because medication and standard therapy may not be sufficient to meet them where they're at and help them to heal. Okay. Also, you use the term spiritual emergency as opposed to spiritual emergence. I wonder if you'd make mm. that distinction for us. Mm, yes, <laughs> you're making me think hard. Yes, I guess maybe there's some cultural differences in how the language is used. Um, here in the UK, we, we might talk about managing spiritual crisis, having a spiritual emergency or a spiritual emergence. I mean, for me, these are phenomena where mind has perhaps expanded at quite a rapid rate mm -hmm. um, and where the content maybe has a particular kind of flavor to it uh, maybe with a particular lens of interpretation which can then be either solidified or kind of made a bit more malleable depending on who you talk to when you have this experience. Sure. Well, ma many, um, basically everybody that's here has been through at least one and in many cases, many more than one. I digress. I pulled you off track. Please go ahead. Uh, well, let me, uh, the way I understand uh, spiritual emergence is just a normal thing. And it's not a psychotic break, whereas a spiritual emergency is kind of bordering on a psychotic break. So that's how I would define it. But that's USA talk. <laughs> yeah, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite convinced about that because I never, you know, while I do acknowledge I had a spiritual emergence, but some of the things that happened to me were quite emergent and they weren't religious 
per se, necessarily. I, I wouldn't have called them spiritual per se, although some of them had a patina of Christianity in them. Yeah, I guess on one or two occasions, even Buddhism. But, you know, they had a patina of Christianity, but they didn't bring me back to Christianity or any other such thing. But they certainly were, only in one case did I really think it was an emergency. And because I had to react to it in a in five seconds, it was there and then it was gone. And, you know, it manifested as Mephistopheles. So otherwise, I would say they were an emergence of my, my psyche in a way more toward the, the Eros side. But uh, I, you know, I don't think, it, if spiritual has the connotation of religious, it wasn't, to me, it wasn't that, okay? Although it had a relig- this religious patina And to me, except for that one occasion when I encountered Mephistopheles, it was not an emergency per se. It was, Mm. it was shocking. It was, they were numinous. They were shocking. I've got a few of them on video, but they weren't emergencies per se. But anyway, I, so let me shut up. Yeah. I mean, for me, I guess for some clarity, I think I, I make a separation between spiritual and religious um, with spirituality kind of being this more open flavor um, not necessarily committed to any denomination but I like to use the language of the heart of hearts you know this kind of step beyond and back um, where we might meet each other um, irrespective of our faith practice um, but yeah just I mean to continue a bit I mean it's part of part of the narrative and and the way that I make sense of these experiences, both personally and professionally is, as I say, sort of trying to expand the biopsychosocial spiritual model. So my early work was uh, neuroimaging, uh, looking at the brain networks and the brain regions that are sort of working or not working quite so well uh, in people with the diagnosis of schizophrenia and certainly working in a research capacity, the diagnostic criteria was important. Um, and the, the, the patients that I saw for those studies were screened according to those categories. Um, and, you know, this work for me was, was really about diving deep into, you know, the brain networks that are involved in social cognition. How do we uh, understand other minds, how do we process spatial expressions of emotion, um, and some postdoctoral work looking at uh, what we call visual scan paths, um, really trying to understand how visual information p- particularly is processed by the brain, um, and particularly when the brain is, is, is having some, some troubles or having some, some difficulties of, of this particular kind, you know, this particular kind where you know, things get a bit fruity, things get a bit uh, difficult, walls, walls start looking a little bit different. Um, and as I was doing this work, I, I was aware of maybe some of the limitations in, in the treatment models uh, for, for schizophrenia and psychosis. Uh, I was in my own journey of, of maybe coming back to my body and trying to balance all this academic work and PhDs and masters and all the rest of it. And I began training in Shaolin Kung Fu. So I started that when I was about halfway through my PhD process, uh, training with a teacher in London. Uh, we, we do have a lineage back to the Shaolin Temple, but it was a Western system, you know, South London, <laughs> South London crew, uh, training in the gym at the Maudsley Hospital, which is part of the Institute of Psychiatry. So I, I did my, my body and my healing work right in the middle of, of all that madness there. And I, I say that kind of lightly, I I don't minimize, but we were literally in the middle of the hospital doing that. And this for me was a huge part of my healing journey, back back to the body, balancing the left and the right hemispheres, but really discovering how the body and the moving body and the challenges of the martial arts training force us to dig deep, uh, force us to dig deep into ourselves, our habits, our patterns, our reactivity and our fears. And, you know, my, my ego structures went with me 
into the training. So I liked it kind of hard and a bit brutal and, you know, the Yang style came out, the, the sort of patriarchal <laughs> uh, line of, of dominance came out a little bit, um, you know, and, and I, I went to black belt level uh, in that system. And, you know, it was incredible actually to, to do a training that even though I'd been quite sporty and quite active as a youngster, it felt that it really touched parts of the body and mind and soul that, that other sports didn't really reach. So I understood that it had this special quality. It comes from the Mochan lineage of Buddhism, but we weren't a system that really dove into that. There wasn't really explicit Buddhist teachings, but you know, the body is our implicit teacher. Uh, so we learn often without awareness. And as I came through my career and I'm often reflecting on what is the knowledge, where does it come from? which parts of the knowledge journey have had the most impact. And quite often I come back to, to the martial arts training as, as really one of the strongest influences on my work currently. And I'm really full of gratitude actually for that blend of Eastern and Western approaches. And I drew on this when I started thinking about how can we help people who are really experiencing odd things <laughs> you know who are afraid to come to services often who can't sit still and have talking therapies perhaps in the way that we might like to offer them and actually who i believe are traumatized often through body means how can we blend this Eastern and Western movement and psychotherapy traditions to help this healing? And I started using this blend of what I knew about the brain and the brain networks to inform practices that included the body and the mind. I discovered secular mindfulness as a thing. <laughs> coming across the work of Oxford University Mindfulness Center and something called mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. And when I looked at the papers and read about the concepts of mindfulness of the body and various things, I, I had this moment of sort of merging of, of, of my pathways and my intentions. And I understood that maybe I had something that could be helpful that, that sits across a number of disciplines. And I committed to creating then programs of training that can be sort of psychotherapy out of the psychotherapy room, healing through the body, blending of body and mind training. More recently, that's been kind of more into the transpersonal realm. Initially, it was still quite sort of science and clinical psychology based. It's, it's getting bigger. <laughs> it's getting bigger every year. I keep practicing myself, of course. Um, but I was then inspired really to do to, to kind of do it differently. And what's emerged from that is, you know, a, a kind of a methodology, I suppose, that really is it's for the wrigglers it's for the ones with the more open expanded mind states it's for the ones that can't sit still the ones that want to be in the forest healing or walking around and moving healing and it's based on a scientific model which really gives me confidence about why this can actually really be healing particularly for and I just would use the word psychosis of any, of any sort. How would you define transpersonal realm and, and how, are, how are you thinking about it in the context of your practice? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I sort of was kind of on my own developmental journey and I, I'm a big um, fan of the me search story. <laughs> Um, that's one of the first things I, I speak to business leaders about or people that are developing new things. I say, right, let's get to the me search story because if the passion is there, then, you know, it's deeply personal work. It's your own healing journey. 
Um, and while that can really drive us in fantastic ways, it's also what trips us up. <laughs> so, you know, getting, getting to the me search story is, is important. Um, but for me, it was, you know, initially kind of thinking about the neuroscience and, and kind of coming, I, I call it sort of the, the default mode network and beyond. So in the neurocognitive model that I work with, uh, the default mo the default mode network is is our our brain network that that is the theory of mind network. It's the network that we kind of develop and hone around about age four or five as we begin to recognise that there is a mind that is different <laughs> than our mind. So you know this kind of selfishness of the child, or you know actually they call it mind blindness in in autism. Uh, is to do with either an underdeveloped or a kind of differently developing default mode network. But in so-called healthy development, there comes this time where we recognize that what's in my mind may be different from what's in the mind of another. And we begin to have to learn the social skills uh, to navigate difference. And I believe that's extremely important right now in our, in our culture as well. And so this is the land of, I call it the what if, the as if, and the if only network. It's the network that allows us to time travel because while my bottom can only be on the chair here and now, if I'm attending to those sensations, my mind can go to the future, can go back to the past, can be in the present. And it does that in various ways that can either be helpful or harmful. So a classic one I'm talking a lot about now is, you know, this what if function. I mean, we're right in the thick of this anxiety and fear driven. What if, what if, what if, what if? And this is what compromises our capacity to go. What if, what if? What if the world could be like this? What if this is an amazing opportunity to change things? What if it was possible for us to really acknowledge diversity and difference and talk to each other in expand, more expanded and nuanced ways rather than what if I haven't got enough toilet paper? What if I can't get to the shops? What if I get coronavirus? What if I... Uh, what if, uh, yeah, so it's the same brain networks but the tone around it has a very different quality, yeah? And similarly, the reflective function, the, again, I sometimes call it if only, this is when I take my mind back and I'm kind of like, am I reflecting or am I ruminating? Yeah, am I ruminating endlessly, leading me to low mood and feeling guilt and shame and getting stuck in a big spiral of like, I did it all wrong. I wasn't, you know, what if, what if, what if I said that? What if I didn't say that? What if I'd made this decision? What if I'd said no to him or yes to her versus this kind of like, okay, let me reflect. And I wonder what would have happened if I'd have done that. Was there another possibility I didn't explore? How can I take that forwards in terms of the helpful reflection? So the neurocognitive model for me is this amazing blend of like bringing the neuroscience understanding to some things that we really see very commonly in the clinic, anxiety and depression. Um, but if we kind of take the default mode a little bit further, a little bit more open, we come into the as if function, the imagination, the creative function. And I think about young people with autism here, you know, you give a, a, a normally a healthy developing child a banana and you pretend it's a phone and you're having a nice little joke like, oh, it's for you. And you give them the banana because they can pretend. Yeah, they're able to make this switch in the default mode network. Like, I know it's not really a banana, but I'm like playing with you in this game, like of pretending um, because it's funny and it's like a joke. Whereas a young person, on the autistic uh, spectrum would be quite sort of like straight faced and be like, but that's a banana. What are you doing? Yeah. So we know that for certain kinds of, of, of conditions, and again, I'm always hesitating with my language now and, you know, for certain kinds of ways, the, the brain is wired different parts 
of you know the default mode network are configured in slightly different ways is it genetics is it conditioning it's probably both um, but actually as you kind of go a little bit further out and out into the kind of nuance of the default mode network for me there's something that happens where we can really become um, you know, disconnected in both healthy and unhealthy ways. And it's kind of like everything the brain and the mind does can either help us or harm us. So I'm really into this opposites. And maybe that's my Kung Fu training, that checking the opposites, checking what heals can harm, what harms can heal. It's not clear, <laughs> you know, and sometimes we think we're healing and we're harming. You know, I'm looking at this shadow of the psychology profession very deeply right now. Um, because aspects of it have actually harmed me as a professional, you know, including my capacity to really be truly open about my experiences um, because of how that might impact on my capacity to take care of myself and earn money. Right. Um, but I love these kinds of discussions maybe where I can be a bit freer. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, in a psychotic break, in a moment where we really kind of, fly out of the of the matter into something else i i, I sort of refer to this as the, the dmn and beyond um because something different i believe i don't have an answer but something different is happening when consciousness expands or exits whether it's you chose to expand it through meditation practice through 20 years sitting on the cushion through slowly slowly expanding your mind space slowly slowly or poof, the trauma version yeah yeah i had to get out of my body to survive and i just happened to have a mind and brain that was of a particular flavor that allowed me to dissociate to get out to go somewhere safe because horrendous things were happening to me and we're in a sort of weird collective version of that right now, I think. When it's too hard to bear, consciousness wants to go elsewhere. And we've got many ways to facilitate that in our modern environment. Again, ones that are healthy, ones that are not healthy. Spiritual bypass, bit of a problem potentially at this time. Let's all just be flying around in the cosmos because it's like super nice up there and it's pretty tough down here with our feet on the floor. Mm -hmm. Joss jo uh, gave us a little shock treatment. Uh, I think the first time she joined us when she called the coronavirus the love virus. <laughs> I love that. You know what? This is so beautiful because... I was going to share a piece of artwork that a colleague had made and uh, I'll just name check her because she's been instrumental in my journey. Um, and of course, you know, as I've kind of balanced my left and right brain of, I, I've started more drawing, I've started more performance using my body. Um, the transpersonal approach, you know, has, has enabled and, and allowed that, I guess, in a way that the more mainstream clinical psychology evidence-based approach is open but a little bit dis dismissive sometimes but she's a creative catalyst uh and we did a, a very intensive piece of work together over christmas actually 12 days we called it hashtag kill bill christmas where we did like intensive kung fu training and creative practice her name's delphine perot she's also part of this nomadic healers uh associated with how do we heal collective psychosis brazil france uk uh, nomads that travel the world with this work and do it on the streets in our bodies. Yeah, I can say more about that. Um, but she really provides this kind of catalytic container um, to open up how we might approach some of these things in a slightly different way, including uh, through the through the creative arts. Um, so yes, I lost my thread there. Let me pause. Hmm. Are you um, working with, I, I had the impression that maybe you are working heavily with movement. I mean, what, what is your practice? Are you, are you 
sitting with a client in your office or are you in the gym somewhere? Well, again, my practice has evolved. Uh, and my preference is that we're in the park. I mean, my top place to do healing <laughs> is in the park. Uh, now, whether that's a kind of green therapy, walk and talk kind of style, um, that's, that's one version of it. But I mean, I'd rather be there with the, with the punch pads. Uh, this is what Delphine and I were doing. Yeah, we're there with the punch pads. We're putting, we're bringing the anger. We're, we're bringing the kind of what I call the red dragon energy. Um, we're allowing the power, the force, the violence, the aggression, but we would balance that with maybe something a bit more Tai Chi based, which has a sort of softer, we'd be exploring the yin and the yang. Um, and the body is the teacher. And if you have a psychological lens on it, actually it's teaching us all the time about our mind and our mental habits and how we strive and how we push ourselves and how we avoid ourselves how we cheat, how we deceive, <laughs> all the juicy stuff of our, of our experience. Um, but it's, it's interesting because I have a program in Brazil called Body and Mind Training, uh, a teacher training program, which is now kind of the neurocognitive foundations for mindfulness teachers. And our speciality is that we work with movement, play, creativity, based on the neuroscience and the clinical work. And, you know, I, I kind of came at this with a kind of intuitive feel, but with a scientific background. And, you know, I, if we could start again in the therapy room, you know, this is, this is what I would do. You know, therapy work is healing the inner child. It's limited reparenting. Play is a great way to learn. Movement really is a great way to learn. I mean, when we start to move as youngsters, there's a cognitive explosion in the brain movement absolutely facilitates cognitive growth and when we age and we stop moving this is actually when the cognitive decline starts to emerge including decreasing mood so my top tip is you've got to keep moving and you know the chinese have this really down pat um you know keep moving as much as you can to facilitate both mental and physical health that's just reminded me of the thread that I've lost, <laughs> which was talking about Delphine's work and the love virus. And it's beautiful, right? The yin and yang, what harms can heal, what harms can heal, what heals can harm. And I also know many people doing practices, gratitude to the virus. And it sounds radical to those that may not be familiar with these kinds of things, but to me, it makes perfect sense. But she actually took the World Health Organization map uh, what we were calling the death map, um, you know, which is pretty sobering when you look at it. It's not for the faint hearted. Uh, and instead of mapping the hot spots and the big circles for the biggest number of deaths, she overlaid green hearts to turn it into a compassion map. Because of course, what we're finding is where there's the most suffering. We're also really finding some incredible stories of human compassion and human connection. And, you know, I mean, it, it was ever thus, you know, the stories of kindness don't make the news in the same way. But this is one of my top tips, the managing your media. Yeah, my kind of top tips for corporate, you know, how do I manage all of this? Manage your media and, uh, you know, pick one or two news sources, maybe throw in a random one just to get some balance. Uh, pick when you're gonna engage with it make a time when you're going to stay up to date with what's going on, but balance this with connecting with news stories that are about, you know, amazing things that people are doing, you know, incredible stories of compassion, um, you know, connecting to teachers or, or people you, in, you, you know, you, you get inspired by and hear what they are saying, you know, rather than just a kind of, only the BBC or only CNN, like, you know, what's your Rinpoche saying? What's your favorite meditation teacher saying? How you mean what we're doing, doing here? <laughs> you know, how's the compassion? In yeah, like, make, let's see if there's a different narrative. And we know that the mind is very, very pulled to the negative. 
especially my science trained analytic mind. Oh my God, it loves being critical. It loves being analytical. It loves finding the problems and well, I get into it too much sometimes. So for me, it's really kind of can be effortful to say, mind, I really want you to be as interested and pay as much attention, <laughs> you know, to the, to, the, to the nice things of life, to savoring the sun on my skin, you know, the, the waking up without so much pain in my body or, you know, next to somebody I love or snuggling my cat or, you know, the tree that has just blossomed and really making a dedicated intentional effort about what data gets into my brain. Um, because much of what is out there is not kind to our mind. Right. Um, and it's actually harming us. The, the fear reactivity around this situation, I do believe is likely to be more harmful than the physical problems. That's my personal and professional view but i'm not a medical doctor i must say but we know you know mind influences body and right. and, yeah. and of course that that was uh essential to dr young's teaching and the significance of this of the scene behind me again because he was intentionally ruling out of his life when he went to Bollingen. he was intentionally ruling out the modern world. And so he never plumbed nor electrified uh, his house in Bollingen because when he was there, um, as he once said, he, um, the only thing a medieval man would find different from the medieval world was the matches. But uh, aside from that, uh, everything was as it would have been maybe in the 16th century or something like that. And he intentionally was ruling out the modern world so that he could experience uh, the medieval mind, uh, which was, um, as he said, before epistemological criticism, before people started to yak at it in all different directions and try to pinch it here and there and so on. He wanted to see, okay, how does this come up from the primitive mind? And, uh, and that's one of his great insights. And, and it, it speaks to his statement that this was his confession of faith. Um, and it, it was his confession of faith in the fact that he was physically building that house brick by brick himself, right? Yeah, so anyway. Well, and... And again, I'm, I'm just mindful that I maybe didn't finish answering that, that point about, about the transpersonal, but um, as you drop that in, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm currently sitting in an empty and unfurnished uh, farmhouse, which uh, with my colleague, Tony Langford, um, from the Mindfulness Center of Excellence, we're intending to um, create a, a retreat and re research center, um, which will have some focus on what is a next generation healer um, and our most immediate and prior task I, I believe will be healing the traumatized doctors and nurses from the mainstream model um, and I mean I don't quite want to say reprogramming but it's got a flavor of that because their training is is quite brutalizing their tribe is quite punishing and yeah. what's being asked of them now is 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 very difficult there's going to be and, a lot of ptsd <laughs> yes yes a lot and, of it you know some of my other work as i've as i've matured my own view over the years has been with what we call in the uk peer peer trainers peer supporters experts by experience and for mm -hmm. psychosis i think this is particularly important um you know how do we um how do we listen <laughs> deeply listen without prejudice, without our professional lens too, too firmly in place, you know, to the experiences of our, our patients and, and particularly with those who have managed to heal in different ways. So if people are interested on, on the Mindfulness Center site, there's a, a project, about, we call it, it's called Weathering Storms. And this is a colleague who came to me uh, because he saw I was interested in mindful movement and Tai Chi 
and had this interest in psychosis and he would be a great guest on here actually he's he's incredible what um, what is his he, name what he is can this? tell his own story but um what is his name his name is anthony fiddler and his website is eastern anthony fiddler how, how do you spell his, his website last name? is easternpeace.co.uk Eastern and he's been developing a program called Heart Touch. Heart what? F I D L E R. Yeah, I'm sorry. We're we're getting a little bit in, attenuated with your feed right now. Tomorrow, in fact, we might have lost you. I was watching a story today where, the, like, in India. People are not letting doctors and nurses who are dying at their burial to happen. Wow. And there are multiple cases like that. Yeah, so there are right. There are like attacks. So what are they doing? Yeah. What what's happening, Kushpo? They're not allowing uh, doctors and nurses who die from coronavirus to be buried. Really? Yeah. What What is their thinking on that? I don't know. How can we describe how ignorance and stupidity, fear and hysteria, everything come together and think right. like how, that is a collective. <laughs> yeah. I right. don't know how they are thinking. I don't even want to know how they are thinking. It's terrifying. It's uh -huh. terrifying. How can... And, and a 14-year-old boy was giving this account about his father's funeral, like 45 year old doctor. And I'm like, why am I still alive, God? What do you want me to see more? Like, right. Kushpu is just telling us, Tamara, in your absence, that in India, uh, they are not allowing doctors and nurses who uh, die from coronavirus to be buried. The shadow of the medical profession is with us now. I mean, shadow. I in our face everywhere and you know as I say I can look at my own profession and I'm involved in a number of dialogues um, particularly with psychologists that want to extend the model uh, particularly into the the, the, the spiritual um, but but maybe feel inhibited by professional boundaries and guidelines that's that's been some of my own struggle um, to work kindly with with the the mind of psychosis and 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 help to tease apart you know what's the trauma and what's the insight yeah and i guess working with anthony who i was just mentioning before i i dropped out you know his his journey has been some of that you know how to tease apart the stuff that's the trauma and the stuff that's making contact with something different something different different sources of knowledge different sensing and what struck me was, again, I'm not really a, a sort of, I'm a mix and blend, you know, I'm a bit of a magpie. Um, so, you know, I, I can speak to some Buddhist concepts, but I haven't studied it, you know, at depth. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe I, I, I have a, a naive view of some of it. But, you know, when I was reading about the experiences of some very experienced practitioners of meditation, they, they looked a bit similar <laughs> to right. some of the stuff. That, that my clients were, were talking to me about. And I was fascinated by this. And, and in, my, in the model I work with, with the DMN, it's kind of like, look, we work through our stuff. The mind expands. Now, how you do that, there's, you can do it with LSD, you can do it with years of therapy, you can do it with ayahuasca, you can do it because trauma or near-death experience pops you right out there. You can do it in a variety of, of faith practice traditions. Um, of course, the Buddhists have kind of nailed the, the systemic outlining of the processes that you need to kind of travel through to, to access these different non-ordinary states of consciousness, non-duality. Um, but working with Anthony, you know, he's really gone. He's used meditation, Tai Chi, Reiki, all alternative methods 
um, but much of it around movement practice to be able to stay with the stuff that frightens others. <laughs> You so know, let, let's maybe. go back for let's just go back for a moment and uh, get the information you were giving us about the, his center. So it's Anthony Fiddler, F I D L E R. Mm -hmm. and it's called the Eastern EasternPeace.co.uk is the website. Is that correct? That's the website. So it's not a center as such, but okay. he's, and, but he's part of. Collaborators of the Mindfulness Center. Yeah, okay, he's a then, collaborator of the Mindfulness Center of Excellence. Okay, and then you you said something about heart, but then I lost the thread ah, after yes. that. Yes, well, his his program is called Heart Touch. Heart Touch. And of course, as Buddhists, of course, and those that are practicing deep faith practice will tell you, you know, the, the real brain is, is the heart brain, the heart mind. And uh, working with neuroscientists that are becoming interested in, in what they call the contemplative traditions. Uh, one of the, the kind of early pioneers is, is Richie Davidson, based in the US. And he tells this anecdote. I'm, I'm, I'm telling somebody else's anecdote here, but it's a, it's a great illustration. Uh, when he went to study monks living up in hermit caves in the Himalayas, and he took an EEG helmet, um, you know, with the electrodes to study the brains of these meditators. And he, he wanted to demonstrate to the monks, you know, you put it on your head, this is what it looks like. And they started laughing. And through the translator, you know, he was kind of saying, yes, it looks a bit funny and it looks like a kind of hat. And then the translator said, no, they're, they're laughing because they don't understand why you're putting it on your head. You know, here is the, here, you want to put it here. <laughs> and yeah, so yeah. This, is, this is the East and the West, right? This cognocentric, right. brain-centered way of seeing and understanding the world that I think really is, is, in a, is in a shift now. And whether this is the yang rotating to the yin um, or, or the East meeting the West, or, or however we want to understand it. I think this is the, the fundamental shift of consciousness, is, is recognizing that there's a consciousness in the heart. So I, I think, at the Mindfulness Center, we do have a number of, of programs that, that kind of try to look at this, and including one which is called the Heartfulness Project, which is, again, a fantastic colleague, Maya Campbell, quantum physicist who, who in her own journey came through heart failure, heart, heart problems, continue, you know, continues to have heart failure, but uses meditation practices, specifically compassion, um, as, as a form of healing. Um, I want to just bring to your attention, and I hope that you can address this later. Um, I started last week or two weeks ago, um, publishing our uh, Buddhist meditations, of which Cindy is a part, um, on, on the YouTube channel. Um, and uh, today I got a very interesting, um, uh, interesting response to it that I just want to read to you because it has to do with this East-West uh, material and I, I won't tell you what I how I responded to it you'll have to go to uh, Monday's session which is the top thing on the YouTube channel at the moment but I, I just want to say what he said and uh, I came back at him pretty hard but um, he said like Jung said my criticism is direct and this is to the Buddhist po post that I put up right he says, my criticism is directed solely against the application of yoga to the peoples of the world. The spiritual development of the West has been along entirely different lines from that of the East and has therefore produced conditions which are the most unfavorable soil one can think of for the application of yoga. Western civilization is scarcely a thousand years old and must first of all free itself from its barbarous one-sidedness. This means above all deeper insight into the nature of man, but no insight is gained by rep repressing and controlling the unconscious, and least of all, 
by imitating methods which have grown up under totally different psychological conditions. In the course of the centuries, the West will produce its own yoga. Okay, and I, let's see, was he yeah, yeah, quoted? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's what he said. I, I, uh, I think I, Which is, um, I, I slammed that, but any, I anyway. I will comment on that. Yeah, go ahead. I, I wanted to comment on that. Go ahead, Kushpu. Oh, okay, okay. So, so yes, so um, which is this? What, what is what? Young is saying in this is very true, because um, like very recently, because of our quarantine time, I started reading actual book of yoga instead of all this facilitator and um, who mostly are Westerners. Pardon my limited vocabulary here. Um, but, uh, and so, so it, so in, in the way it appears on screen, when it is written by other people, it is mostly about the body. Um, but if you read the scripture, which, which, which is about, uh, uh, yoga, it's about balancing. It's about rhythm. It's, um, yeah, it's about balancing and rhythm. So it's more like a dance than a. I don't know, then a boxing match. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, yeah. But Tamara, I would, I yeah. would really appreciate both you and or uh, Kushbu responding to that comment that was made on the, on the Buddhist video this morning. And yeah. You could also respond to what I said, but I, I'm not going to bring that in. I just want to hear what you want to say now. Well, I mean, maybe a, a parallel might might help. I mean, we, we're we're in this debate about secular mindfulness um, very strongly uh, here in the UK, and I think Ron Purser in the US pr produced this book, Muck Mindfulness which fundamentally was a critique about how the secularization of mindfulness has, you know, literally lost the heart of it. Um, and it's fascinating to me because, you know, actually the creator, also like the creator of secular mindfulness, one of the originators is, is John Kabat-Zinn, who created mindfulness-based stress reduction, a program that, that has been um, subjected to evidence-based clinical trials across a variety of of, of areas of medicine very successfully. And he positioned it as sort of secular, I like to call it almost like a meze platter of, of Buddhist practices that, you know, the Buddhists sort of recoil at the simplicity of it, but actually they have been very helpful for people that would never put a foot uh, in a Buddhist center or never would, um, you know, go into those kinds of practices. And it's clear that it has benefits for people, but it's come with some costs. And one of the costs which we debate quite a lot within the Brazilian community, where they're much more open to the spiritual side of things um, and wouldn't need to feel that they had to keep that out of it in the medical setting in the same way that we do in the UK and, and the US, basically saying, well, it's put a lid on spiritual development because you do an eight week course and you think that you've done mindfulness. And actually the reality is it's a very complex beast one of my students, Tiago Tatan, did a review in Brazil, actually. He's based in uh, Rio Grande do Sol, Porto Alegre. Uh, he said there's 94 different definitions of uh, mindfulness out there in the literature at the moment. The Buddhists can't agree. The cognitive scientists can't agree. The neuroscientists can't agree. Everybody's getting in a fuss about it. And that's partly why I wrote that book, Hashtag What is Mindfulness? It's kind of like, listen, it's for you to discover you know, as my friend said, listen, it's your Kung Fu. It's you to discover your Kung Fu. You've got teachers, you've got guides, you've got practices, but it's your Kung Fu. You need to have it in your body in the way that makes sense to you in your context. Now, that's not the same as finding a guru and getting into a lineage and having this quite male style structured spiritual pathway. This is the mess and the bleh of the feminine, right? You know, I'm, you know, my, my spirituality is wiping the ass of the baby and caring for the sick and 
you know, the birth of the child and the blood and the puke and all the rest of it. And, you know, my, my, my path to integration is, you know, up, but we don't want to go down. We want to do both simultaneously and, and meet in the heart. Um, and, and that for me is that Qigong image of, you know, mind to the cosmos, mind to the center of the earth and a big glowing heart in the middle that I, I can kind of rotate around. Um, but it's tricky because people are wedded a bit to their practices. They're wedded to their teachers, sometimes in unhealthy ways. I don't think anybody's got it right. You know, maybe psychology lost its heart, but you know, certainly the spiritual communities need some, some growing up actually, many of them, uh, including around their own developmental psychology. Um, much of this sexual abuse scandals that we see and, and, and problems with spiritual teachers, it's, it's just indulgent adolescent behavior and, and incapacity to, to be with power. And this is the basics of a, of a psychological inquiry. Um, and it's just not done, you know, and they're not supervised and they can't be challenged. And, you know, this is not okay anymore. I don't want to learn from this kind of a teacher. We see the problems and I, Boy, how, how well I know in this household, because, uh, my wife was very carefully following uh, Sojal Rinpoche with Rigpa. There are some members of the Rigpa group in Washington who were very much into, into him specifically. And then I, I pr presume you might have heard of the scandals that came out of his behavior. Part of them were in the UK. Those followers of him and for debbie it was it's been 25 years and she did a three-year retreat in buddhism in in okay. according to the rigpa method wow what a disillusionment that came out of it with terrible and uh debbie is much more balanced than some of the others i never really got into buddhism as much as my wife did uh and as, as I say, she's now a lay teacher. She did everything but an ordination in Buddhism. I couldn't do that because uh, I went to a Rigpa meeting one time. Rinpoche was, had very impolitely gathered at people around from all over the Washington area to do a session with him. And then he didn't show up until about an hour late. And he came in and sat down and he said, okay, let's meditate. And we meditated for two minutes and then he comes out of it and he's, he says, well, I've got to go. And he starts to put his coat on. And one of the ladies in the back says, oh, but Rinpoche, we, we thought you will meditate with us. And he says, well, I have meditated with you and now I'm going to the airport. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, my God, we could not get ourselves, you know, I could never, I, I could never do all these prostrations and things like that. I, maybe Cindy gets into it more than I do, but uh, I can never, I could never do that with, a, with any teacher. I mean, uh, it's, but. There's a really great book I recommend to people. Um, I can't remember the author, but it's called Sex and the Spiritual Teacher. And uh, it's a fantastic breakdown from a, a, a quite a nuanced psychological orientation of the different types of sexual offenders in the spiritual communities, ranging from the outright psychopaths to, you know, the flawed teachers that didn't have their own needs met as a kid who are trying to heal themselves, um, you know, to the ones that genuinely might fall in love with a student and, and you know, might want to, to pursue something with them. But I think critically, and what I thought was great about the book was there was a chapter which was about the role of the student and this idealization. Um, and secular mindfulness, we can manage it in a slightly different way. But, you know, I'm I'm aware of it when I'm in a, in a role as kind of program developer or founder of a program. And, you know, we have this phrase that we use, which is like, your students need to know that you go to Starbucks, right? Your 
students need to know that you get your coffee in Starbucks, right? It's like, you're a human being, you're to, you know, you've got the flaws, we're all trying our best. And, you know, my, my top tip to people is the culture of supervision is, is, is one of the great things of psychology. It's really one of the great things of psychology. And some of the work I'm trying to do is, is influence at board level. And of course, board governance and board supervision is a, is a pretty hot topic at the moment because there's a lot of very, very uh, problematic decision making going on in, in some of these in some of these environments and you know any board that is not okay to be observed in the decision making process is already problematic from my point of view sure um, oh yeah. yeah i agree with you um, entirely but it's, about but it's that tricky it's tricky it's tricky um and so many and, so many boards are dominated in the way that our president tries to dominate everybody around him uh, you know yes and how do we really give the voices that matter space and kind of what i love about this shift to online working is you know you've got a chat box where you can talk to everybody you can talk privately mm -hmm. and it's fascinating to me how something that we normally might think like oh god it's not the same as in a meeting there's actually some amazing positive things coming out in terms of allowing the introverts mm -hmm. more space to have their voice in the room right. uh, and also allowing people to communicate in a private way where maybe they can say the things that they couldn't say in the boardroom or in the meeting kind of in the old model because of fear of punishment or fear of humiliation you know you can access the chairman through a private comment maybe in a different way so i'm i'm excited about this i know many of my mindfulness community are like in a panic about you know the the attention sapping properties of technology and how it's ruining this beautiful embodied experience that we're used to having in the temple or in the buddhist center or whatever but I think there's some advantages that could be overlooked if we, if we can be more balanced, yeah, more balanced in our view. Right, right. I, I, I'm, I'm going to hold back for a bit here and give others a chance. As you, as you rightly say, we have to give others a chance. Uh, Tim, do you have any reaction so far? Or? Well, I was struck by um, a phrase you used. Um, about a minute ago about uh, monitoring this, this, uh, uh, I don't know, the structure the community or the, the leader. What, what was that phrase you used? Uh, I think I was, maybe was I talking about supervision or? Yeah, mon monitoring the boardroom or something, psychology monitoring Observation. the boardroom. Yeah, so, um, sorry, I can't remember. Um, I was talking the boardroom context or the spiritual community context, or well, it's the same issues, right? Gurus and people in high positions of power who are adored by many, right. maybe with some psychopathic narcissistic traits. That's why they got there. <laughs> um, but um, you know, how do we? Yeah, how do we monitor the thinking process? How do we monitor the decision making? How do we check that it's for the benefit of all? How do we understand the long-term implications, the implications for the planet? This is the wider lens of attention, not just the short-term profits. Um, that's more business language I'm using there, but you know, kind of the models are the same maybe. How do you build a sustainable community that doesn't have this founder's syndrome? I'm constantly monitoring this. Founder's syndrome is, is problematic. It's not sustainable. It means the the work is finished when the leader's gone. And maybe that's a bit Taoist. You could kind of put that in a Taoist framework if you want, but you know, if you want to build something great that helps people long-term, it's not about the individual, but you need the kind of energy of the slightly narcissistic charisma to like get the thing going, but you need a process to get them out before they wreck it. <laughs> maybe I can check myself for that too, right? <laughs> And that's I, ser I certainly have to check myself on that. So go ahead. That's that's why humility is such a such a blessed um, attribute, especially for a charismatic leader. I think of Nelson Mandela, who had that 
that beautiful humility that that enlarged his character and uh, uh, Archbishop Tutu who's actually kind of a friend of mine uh, has that same thing he he has this this kind of astonishing presence that the first time I met him was in a room of like 300 people and he's so short but as soon as he came into the room the the presence was felt by everybody mm-hmm. and and yet he doesn't have this enormous ego he's got this incredibly humility uh humility that that is um uh, is really profound and i feel that in some of these these great spiritual leaders like gandhi or uh martin luther king uh, and I think it's a it's a rare balance to have both the temerity and the the courage to uh, to you know take the world by the throat in a in a way, and also to have this enormous humility that it's it's not my doing that is causing this this tsunami. It's the the doing of something beyond me. I think that's just such a precious attitude and very rare. And I don't know how um, how there could be. I, I recognize that if there's something like a board, there's already a mechanism for oversight of of an institution or something. But without that, if you've just got a leader, I'm just curious how you think that can be mitigated in a in a reasonable way. That kind of uh, inflation could be mitigated. Do you have any ideas yeah. on that? I just want to take exception a little bit because I think most corporate boards I've seen aren't really oversight. Typically, they're just uh, goomba buddies of the chairman, and and uh, so therefore they don't truly exercise uh, oversight. They're basically rubber stamps. But go ahead. Right. Somebody. Yeah. And I guess yes, I'm thinking yeah. of of a really well run nonprofit or something that that really has a you know a healthy board that board would um, would would provide a kind of a balance to a charismatic leader, but without that board, there's really nothing unless there's like a a huge revolution of the of the uh populace or something. Well, I, well, one of the projects I'm involved in is, is um, called Demisc Board Sciences, and, and we wanted to think what is a next generation board that includes the knowledge of neuroscience, psychology, relationship dynamics at a fundamental level as part of the decision making process. Now, I have to say, traction has been very slow in terms of actual uptake, but we've done the conceptual thinking (laughs) and we're feeling strong about if there is anybody who wants to do the right thing. (laughs) We've got some really great tools and some really great frameworks to help senior leadership and boards, you know, be more be more mature in many ways. (laughs) Uh, just just for clarity, people. just for clarity, tomorrow there isn't any such board. <laughs> but I'm not saying it's not needed. I'm only saying there is no such board at the moment. And and I have to I have to admit that uh, I'm in the center of setting up three corporations right now, and. And I see the dynamic of it happening again. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and and it's unavoidable uh, because, for example, we this this organization, which all three are basically the same organization, except for legal purposes, the the leader of the thing is definitely charismatic, but. You know, I happen to be one of his Goomba buddies or a father figure or something like that. And, you know, and how, how do I, how do I exercise oversight 
on this guy who I've brought up over the last 15 years? It's a, it's a question. Well, and, and, and again, we, we can go to the psychological uh, ways of working and, and, you know, let's cherry pick the things that are really helpful. So, you know, contracting, I mean, contracting how you're going to argue, contracting your challenge, contracting when, who you can bring in and when and under what circumstances to provide a fresh set of eyes, you know, increasing diversity on boards, like really properly diversity, people that really actually think differently, not just like, oh, we've got a woman that like acts like a man, you know, really encouraging diversity and rotating boards, rotating chairmen, you know, putting in processes to mitigate, you know, and anybody that doesn't agree to that is already a red flag, is already a red flag. And then it's like, how are you going to mitigate around that? And at the start is where you need to do it, isn't it? It's pretty hard to go in and change things afterwards. And, you know, this is the work of psychology, isn't it? Is the next generation psychology purely preventative at the level of parenting skills training so that people don't need to come to the therapy room? I mean, that's my mission. I kind of want to put myself out of work as a clinical psychologist. I want the whole field to just not exist because we have enough knowledge that if we put it in the right place, you know, at the parenting level, at the school level, yeah, if we put it in the right, at the board level, we will not have this tsunami of mental health problems. I mean, now is a kind of different moment, but before coronavirus, you know, it's like, why do we have this tsunami of mental health problems? We're smart. We have the knowledge you know, but it means we've got to have difficult conversations and we need training in how to do that because it's not easy because we're human and we don't like it. You know, we don't, you know, the shadow work. And this is the Jungian bit that for me, I love it, right? You know, it's this kind of, it's okay that you've got this dark parts of yourself. It's just how it is. It's like, it's not about blaming. It's not about shaming. It's about saying that the universal principle of equal and opposite force means the stronger that you can love, the stronger you can hate. And I don't, I don't know if it was my right. country well, that I'm, told I'm, me that or being interested in. I, I'm definitely, you know, so. I'm definitely seeing the ins and outs of that right now because, uh, fortunately, my relationship with this individual is like father and son, and. So I can talk to him directly and correct him when it's necessary. And I do have done and do do, but everybody else around him uh, is, is, uh, you know, deferential uh, to say the least. Certainly some of the other prospective members of the board typically are, um, are high level, very experienced Indian businessmen. So they're extremely patriarchal. And so it's going to be yeah. an interesting challenge to balance uh, all those very things. Nice. But anyway, I'm sorry, I, I uh, pulled your train of thought off, Tim. So let me shut up again. That's just a subject I'm curious about. Um, in the, in the period where we're headed into, where we really need creative, powerful, imaginative people to help us transform the culture into something more sustainable and more responsive. I think one of the things that I would like to see the, the developed is sort of a, a way of monitoring each other in the capacity of being powerful idea creators. And in, in a way, it's kind of what this group does, this, this idea of a, of a kind of council of elders, a, a group of people who are really concerned and really plugged into psychological issues and the movement of cultural transformation and the evolution of humanity. We need each other to be able to provide a balance and we need to develop our own skills of humility 
And at the same time, we need to have the, the powerful temerity to be able to say, oh, I have this marvelous transformative idea and I, I want to I explode with the, the capacity that this idea has to transform a great number of people. We need both that kind of, of intense creativity and also this kind of, of introverted humility. And it's very hard to find both of those in the same package. It would be great if, if, the, if a community like this one, for instance, could develop both ends of that spectrum so that we can encourage each other to be powerfully creative and at the same time to wind back our own, our own uh, e ego. But as you're talking, this for me is the yin and the yang, right? It's the yin and the yang. It's the creative, the expansive versus the directive, you know, the strategy, the quarterly reports, the targets, the outcomes versus the kind of blue skies thinking. And, you know, we, we might find that in a balanced individual, uh, the capacity to, to, to be in both spaces. And I would go to the neuroscientific model and say, actually, you know, the mindfulness training for me is about the capacity to be able to switch mindfully between different types of, let's call it focused attention versus open monitoring uh, lenses of attention. Um, and then you could sort of map that to cognitive tasks. But failing that, then, then really the task is how do we nurture true cognitive diversity? Yeah, you need the kind of massive expansive mind and, you know, really next generation board. You know, do you want the channeler there? Do you want the medium there? Do you want the person that can sense things that are very, very different from everybody else in the room? Yeah, but you might also need the guy that can do the spreadsheets or the woman that can do the spreadsheets or the person that gets joy, you know, from the detail of the minutia. Um, and, and how do we have all of those people in the same room together? Now, that's the challenge, actually, um, because they're all out there, um, but they often clash <laughs> because they're different. And, you know, that's actually what this farm is probably going to be about, you know, really, how do we celebrate difference? How do we create a kind of common set of operating principles that will allow us to be our own amazing, unique selves, but also be aligned to some common goals? How do we language difference in ways that's not stigmatizing? Yeah, so again, part of my journey is I'm, you know, I'm sort of doing this like slow reveal <laughs> of who I really am. And, you know, some of that is about honoring and embracing this kind of ADHD style that I have. You know, that's why I, I really speak to mindful movement, because to sit on a cushion, at least initially for me was, you know, don't make me sit still. I can't think. I can't process my emotions like that. It's like painful. It, it harms me. I can do it, especially if I'm like motivated, including by money, because, you know, I'm human. Uh, but, you know, it's not my preference. And to do it, I realize now has had some costs on my creative side, on my feminine side, you know, so but how do I talk to my colleague who, who maybe is a bit more on the spectrum and, you know, he wants to do our work in one way and I need to have it another way. And, you know, I want to be out in the farm and walking around in nature to have our meetings and he wants to have a spreadsheet with all the items on it where we tick them off one by one. And, and how do we work together? Now, the answer to that is we really must align on purpose because it's when we have those common values, like literally tattooed on our eyeballs, that we can hold the bigger vision in mind when we meet the bumps of like, this isn't how I like to work, but actually I need you. <laughs> I need your skills and I haven't got them. And if we both agree that this bigger picture is important, then I need to sit on some of my own stuff. Not all the time, not every meeting, because then that's not fair. But the moments when his skills are needed and my skills aren't, I need to do everything I can that makes his work easier. 
And when my skills are needed and they're more in the forefront, his job is to get underneath and just push me and use all of his skills to let me rise up, to let me do the things that will allow my mind and brain to work. Now, this is a totally different style of running meetings, running organizations, doing business. I don't know if it's like blind optimism or some kind of crazy delusion that I have that we could actually do it. But I do believe that coming in with a kind of neurocognitive understanding of what's going on in the brain and the mind can help us to at least try to figure out what that looks like in our own context. Yes, bring, that's in bring, bringing it to bringing it to consciousness is certainly a start. Well, I yeah, like this conscious helpful. capitalism idea. The Brazilians are on top of this, actually. I mean, weirdly, there's so much chaos there, but in the chaos, we find we find the nuggets of of, of kind of creativity, don't we? And, and real, really innovative solutions. But you know, the conscious capitalist movement, I like it. I like what they're bringing you know, what is real purpose-oriented business development. But, you know, the reality is the money's still there. The money, it's, of course, it's still there. How do we get this balance? And, you know, the, the, the toxicity of the financial system is a, it's a big shadow. It's a big shadow. I, I share a bit. I, I was <laughs> working with him. This, there's an artist in, in Brazil, Arjan Martin. I was kind of sort of, we did a, a, some dialogue actually. And uh, he's, his work is about, you know, the slave trade. And, you know, we were talking about the shadow of the city of London and how this is structures, financial structures, basically built on the blood of Africans. And well, it's not new to say this, <laughs> but it's like, if we're gonna do this work, Let's look at it really, truly. Let's look at it truly. Yes. Yeah, uh, and and how do we have these conversations? It's friggin' hard, you know. It's really tough. And I have this white skin, you know. How do I sit with this conversation? My ancestors. Every, London is full of Tate libraries. Tate libraries. And, you know, mostly they are often full of the kids that didn't have computers at home, whose parents may not have a, a library of encyclopedias that they can, they can draw on. And guess what? Many of them have a different color skin to me. And what is this? What is this? Sorry, I got a bit <laughs> carrying on. Sorry. Well, uh, uh, I would but just... These are the things that, oh. these are the tasks. I would just like to add, going back to your the way you design, uh, get your groups together. Um, uh, I work for a major corporation. I led uh, cultural change uh, and trained leaders and groups. And what we used is what's called a group facilitation, a group facilitator. And we train people in how people thought how they behave. We use the Myers-Briggs type indicator, uh, which is young and based. And everybody got to understand that each person thought, uh, sense different. And so we formed our teams and Skip's familiar with this. We used a Z, which is we used each person's strength. And we went through the strengths in order to come to a decision. And the, the it's a decentralized approach. It's not one boss we're moving from vertical the old-fashioned boss way mm -hmm. to a vertical uh, distribution because we had multidisciplinary teams okay. so you'd have your accountants come to the meeting you'd have your engineers you'd have your systems designers you would have your implementers you'd have your all people involved in the team and so uh, you would do a circular we would call them rounds uh, where each person would contribute and come up with the solution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, it may interest you to know too that that uh, that the senior part of the U.S. military has adopted this for forty years. Okay, I mean I I've been to 
I've been to four senior schools in the U.S. military, the Naval War College, the National War College, the Industrial College of the Armed Forces, and Command and Staff College. And at every one of them, we, we studied this approach that Jerome is talking about. Yeah, it's a, a creative leadership center for creative leadership that all these military people go to. Uh, I went to that, uh, and you learn about how to uh, how people operate and how to get people on the team and how to cooperate with the team. You do, you do have to. Uh, one of the things there's a dog barking. Kush Vu's dog. Okay. Uh, one of the things uh, Tamara mentioned is she talked about mirroring, uh, I think, in terms of she would mirror uh, other people. And it's kind of like you almost have to do that between other people and figure out how to talk to them in their domain and then bring them in uh, to a meeting. And so that's kind of the things that we use in that. And I would argue a skiff about boards because our particular board. Uh, was made up of, uh, they understood the same process that the military does. And so it was based on a model of uh, uh, quality and different uh, tiers. We had seven pillars and include customer satisfaction. Uh, there was a whole feedback system uh, involved. And yeah, that it wasn't your company, though, like a Fortune 1000 country company where they can afford to do that? Uh, well, yeah. Yeah. Okay, because because my issue is around yeah. entrepreneurial companies that that go okay. big very fast and and aren't that mature yet. Well, I understand that, but also I've I've there is some literature on the Malcolm Bridge uh, quality assurance uh, method. I don't know if you've heard of it, Malcolm Baldridge, and there is some evidence I found somewhere of using it. Uh, there's some groups that are using it in establishing these groups, small groups like you're talking about. And they've even been funded by the government for uh, helping. So there is some, uh, there is some information about it. Uh, but uh, anyway, that's, uh, you know, there, there are solutions. Uh, it's just how do we put that team together? <laughs> well, we have put it together and I, I hope tomorrow we'll, um, will join us on a regular basis and not consider that it's only, the only time you can come tomorrow is when you're featured. We'd, ra we'd rather have you become a regular part of the group because the, the discussion that we're having, we're, we don't have any uh, dog in the fight in psychology per se, okay? And, but we do have... Um, a lot of experience and we're working through a lot of issues here that that I'm sure you could make contributions to and also would attract people to your practice so and what you want to do uh, as as you make those contributions because we are uh, starting to get people to pay attention and in a very short period of time I mean we've only been doing this uh, this is the 14th session, but um, it, it's a lot of interesting, very thoughtful perspectives that are being presented. I, I want to bring in Nancy for a moment, for not a moment, but for what she needs, because Nancy comes uh, to us from a more uh, Christian perspective, and also she's got a master's degree in Christian spirituality. So I. I think we'd like to hear from Nancy and uh, some some of the others too. And then at the end, I still have one question, something you said earlier, but I'm going to come back to that after others have had a chance. Nancy? Tamara, Tamara, it's just great having you. I'm just delighted in what you've shared with us. I was wondering if you had heard of Cynthia Bougeau and her work with Centering Prayer because she gets into some of these uh, other levels of consciousness and mind expanding and that kind of thing. And her book, The Heart of Centering Prayer, is quite good. And I'd be interested to know if you uh, know her or have read any of her things. 
Yes, the, the, the name and the uh, practice is familiar to me, but it's not something that I've personally practiced. But there's so many overlaps, I think. Yes, that's true. Overlaps, but with a, a nuance around the edge. Um, I've also been looking at this Anthony de Mello. This is this connotation that, that mixes, I think it's a kind of Catholic and a... Yes, and a I think he's a Jesuit and does a lot with... Uh, uh, the script. Now, one of the things he used to do a lot with was to bring people to the scriptures, have them go into their imagination, and take a take on one of the characters in the story that maybe Jesus tells, and experience uh, what would happen. And uh, one time, I took the story of the blind beggar. So there's this blind beggar on the road crying out. Jesus, have mercy on me. Son of David, I think he says, have mercy on me. And the disciples all tell him to be quiet, not to bother Jesus. And he, he just says it louder and louder. And so finally Jesus comes over and he heals him. So I, I took the place of the beggar. I took the place of a disciple. I took the place of someone watching. I took the place of oh. Jesus. And in each of those experiences, I guess we would call it active imagination, uh, there was a great informing about myself uh, and broadened my understanding. But I mean, beautiful, right? You, 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 that was enacted, extended cognition in my view. You, you know, you use the body and the positioning and you know, you had multiple cues, not just active imagination. The body was part of that, has a flavor of, of constellation therapy to, to it as well. And I'm a big believer, you know, bring the body into the exploration because it's, it's part of the consciousness, actually. It is part of the consciousness. And some traditions kind of poo-poo the body, but I think that's quite a yang style of, of spiritual development. And the yin, the feminine spirituality is... Of, very much more attuned to the body is my perspective thank you yeah thank you you know i read something recently uh, i think it was by a psychologist and he talked about women need to experience the feminine side of the self capital s like young would say that have you ever run into that particular idea and if you have i'd love any information you could give because I had an experience of the Divine Feminine arising last summer, and it really shifted everything. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what your, your, your question is. I think the, 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 the rise of this energy is, is coming um, more and more now in our times, and I'm, I'm speaking more energetic kind of perspective on this rather than a scientific one. Um, this well, I had not, I had powerful, yeah, heart centered, heart centered energy. That, that, yeah, go ahead. I had not heard of the feminine side of the self. Have you run into that idea? Well, I mean, from a martial arts perspective, everybody has yin and yang, um, and some of that's our kind of energetic history, some of it's our conditioning. Um, the, the, the idea is to get balanced, um, in, as a yin yang individual. Um, I feel there's some interesting changes happening with our young people as they identify less as yin or yang. Um, there's some interesting generational things coming up now about self and gender, gender versus sex and these sorts of things. I mean, for me, a self would have both, <laughs> would have both elements in it, but our society has a, has a particular uh, orientation to, to amplify the yang and to minimize the cognition in our, in our education system, in our influences. And, you know, this is radically changing at the moment. And I, I, pray <laughs> that it keeps doing so because this very competitive yang style way of engaging with the world i think is an element of, of what's created a lot of problems um, but in this yin yang orientation i guess linking to tim's point my sometimes when i'm talking about this with people it's like 
you know, to, for, the, for, the, for the wheel to turn, you know, yang needs to release and ying needs to add. And it's much easier to add than it is to let go. <laughs> yeah, attachment is much harder to work with than aversion. Yeah, it's easier for a female martial artist to get yang than it is for a yang martial artist to get more feminine. There's m much more to give up when the yang has to let go. And to ask the yang to let go at this time is particularly tricky because it means having less, being less, doing less, more humility. Uh, and for the feminine, it's like, how do we own our immense power, our immense creative force in ways that are skillful and non-harming? And also, how do we work through the anger of our centuries and millennia of, of, of subjugation without being too harming to ourselves or others so we can reach balance? So we can really have true, true balance, not men acting like women, not women acting like men it, within us and between us, this correct balance of yin and yang. I don't know if that's helpful or not, but try to answer that. Yeah. I wanted to add here something. Yes, please. Go ahead, Kushfu. Yeah. But First of all, I'm into your prayers. <laughs> um, and uh, so, so I, I, I have two things. First, I, uh, I want to ask you. You mentioned about the website, which uh, tracks the the compassion map and um, uh, other things. Something about your friend from uh, something your friend is doing. Can you, can you tell the name of the website? And, uh... Yeah, it was actually, it was a call from the UN to produce some kind of like striking images that could message. They were calling it kindness contagion was one of their kind of campaigns. So she created it for the UN and I don't know if it was like selected or how they're going to do it. She only did it a few weeks ago, but I am going to put a blog about the work um, on the Mindfulness Center of Excellence webpage soon. So, I mean, I can share the image with you or send it to Skip if you want to see it. But I, there will, I will do a blog. I just haven't had time. Um, and then it was connected to this UN campaign. Um, I think it's on something called Talent House, which is where they're asking art, artists and designers to kind of re envisage Talent House. Um, you know, the, the coronavirus uh, impact. If you Google Talent House, Talent, UN, House, Talent House by UN. And then mm. UN, like, you know, United Nations, I think it will probably come up. I don't know if you'll find her picture, but there's a category called Kindness Contagion and artists all around the world submitted designs. Um, I understood there's a panel, but I, I, I'm not updated as to what she's found, what, what, whether she's got in or not, or what that even means. But we will do something on, on my site as well. Yes. But yeah, yeah how yeah. do we transmute yeah. the shadows? What it is, right? This is alchemy. How do we transmute sure, the Sure, ex ex exactly. And the and, role of art, and, the role of the creative to do that. Yeah. That is where that is where I was coming actually because you you said that there are there are some elements which can be ha harmful with something like uh, and you specifically used the example which is spiritual bypassing. Um, oh, uh, yeah. Remember, so 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 art addiction is is the same thing in oh, that category. Yeah. I feel right. So, yes, I call it the yeah. creative bypass, the spiritual bypass, the expert bypass, the psychology bypass. I mean, it's just ways that we, we step back a bit from the feeling of it. And I find this in some of the creative work. It's fantastic, but like, yeah, like yeah. where is, you know, they, they can trigger it in others, but they haven't worked it through themselves. And, and this is the mad artist, actually. It's like you're really pointing to something that touches people in incredible ways, but your own suffering is part of the narrative. And, you know, it's, it's a sacrifice, actually. But sometimes it's also a bit indulgent, you know. So, yeah, maybe, I would really say to it's check it's that. The, but, um, yeah, yeah, sacrifice, indulgence, 
or a devotion i would say like for a yes. lot of people yeah and and i i am that category like i can um i might not understand but i can devote it like you know i de- devote myself to i i might not fully yeah. get it but i can still devote myself to it i can get obsessed with like fall in love like that uh another thing which i i wanted to mention here that the the story you mentioned about buddhist monk laughed because they put it on the head right uh so so just something something very quickly came into my head that people shoot themselves in the head most of the time they can shoot other places to die quickly and it's a it's the same very and yeah, yeah 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 so it's the same thing it's the same it's we, for me it's, yeah, it's a very this same is the thing. problem <laughs> yeah uh, yeah it's the same same thing but this monk laughed about but in a very very real polarized tragic um shadow side of it maybe i, I feel it is yeah yeah that's, that's so I, uh, i have i have a couple of private notes from uh, one of our participants here uh, marie who uh, may be having a trouble with her voice or something but she has uh, sent me a private note and i i'd like to share it with you uh she, this is marie chotao taco and she says hello skip please read this to nancy um christian theology demonizes the female body and female sexuality splitting the goddess into asexual virtuous Virgin Mary and the carnal prostitute Mary Magdalene women silently carry the burden of this collective unconscious within the family community and also at work uh, she will put in she will put in the category of either the good witch or the bad witch she will be put in the that of those categories our culture prefers a benign peace loving female deity who is powerful but only a partial manifestation of the primal female energy it is important to be able to imagine another possibility in which the dark energies of the goddess ha- uh, could be accommodated in the fullness of her being she is both creative and destructive yes young believe that there is enormous work to be done to heal the split archetype black and white thinking is typical of the young we are we are supposed to grow out of it most people don't seem to get very far with this important developmental project as we move toward our own integration it might become increasingly lonely that is because we simply will not be on the same page with many of the people we know the split goddess is a vivid example of the divided perspective we are not so easily sorted into good and evil categories human beings are a little of each it is a humbling and complicated mess it is also part of why the human spirit is so magnificent so well i just like to say i could i agree with her <laughs> uh i think in my own development uh i was brought through with Christ as the symbol and was able to project the self onto Christ and in relationship then to Christ uh I was in touch with the self and that began to work in me and through me psychologically and then last summer with the arising of the divine feminine that was a, a tremendously shifting experience for me because I experienced the self then as a feminine element and i had not experienced in the christian way a feminine element that uh i could identify with and so now i have that in my life so now i'm working on marie i'm working on how to uh connect that back to the christian story i know that the scriptures uh are 
Mm -hmm. have a lot of archetypal elements that as we expose ourselves to them, we can be healed and we can grow. Um, but I, I certainly agree with what you're saying and have struggled with what uh, you are saying there too and delighted to be on this more broader, more opening path. Thank you so much for your comment. Yeah, that's been a real trouble in the, in the Christian tradition. This, um, this patriarchal idea that is 1700 years old, that, that uh, the feminine um, only appears in a, in a spiritual way. And anytime that the feminine appears in the body, it's, it's always labeled by the power structure as being uh, seductive or somehow a thing of the devil. And I think partially that's a reaction in the early church against sort of the, the competition in the religious world, which was the goddess religions of the Middle East. And all the, the, the patriarchal power structure has ever since then uh, found a good use for that kind of attitude particularly in making people feel guilty about their own coming alive in their bodies, because then they, the church fathers could, uh, could harvest all that guilt and all that um, feeling of uh, inadequacy to, to further the, the power of the church. And that's really unfortunate. And it, we still live with that. But I, I really think that we are at this, this moment, and Jung is a, is a huge part of this, and making us realize that it's the dark feminine that is missing from the, from, the, from the culture. And we need both those elements. We need the feminine and we need the darkness. And that's what will bring our healing, I think. And some of that is the capacity to be with death. Yeah, because this, you know, it's this function of, of being able to, to be with death and, and to be with some of that, that dark side um, that, that the feminine can bring. And oh gosh, it feels like such a long time ago we started this conversation. Actually, we've covered so many topics, but, you know, this, this idea of, yeah, the feminine being able to, to transfer to help the, the passage of, of somebody dying um, you know, to make that communication with the underworld, the Persephone story, Medusa, healing this Athena uh, line. I mean, Jung is, is so rich with these topics. And, you know, another time, maybe I could share some of my experiences of, of, of doing that work um, because it was, it was very pivotal and it's, it's not over. <laughs> um, but the conditioning is significant in our culture and the subversion of the feminine, the sexualization of, you know, women, this, this, this true sensuality, the true sensual power of the feminine, it, it, it is not easy to, to find and express in healthy ways. But I, I really hope that will change as, as time goes on because it's a great source of power, particularly for transformation and change. Um, right. And, yeah. Sexual so, energy yeah. is the strongest one, right? <laughs> so, so <laughs> tomorrow, if, if you don't mind going a few more minutes, uh, we have a few people that haven't been heard from here. Yes, okay. And okay. I, I'd like to give them a, yeah, a chance. And um, uh, Deborah, I'm going to come to you last since you were quite late in joining this conversation. But um, uh, Cindy, uh, you're, you're with us and um, you've been here the whole time. So I'd really like to hear how you uh, react to what we've been talking about in general. Um, well, a, a lot of, a lot of reactions, but um, you know, we've talked about a lot of different things and some of the um, topics that we covered were probably a good hour ago. <laughs> And so I've, I've just been taking a lot in, but the one thing that um, really kind of um, struck me a lot, not more than everything else, but I guess to the point where I would say something, is 
the difference differences um, with the Western notion of mindfulness or meditation, and um, and I see that on a very didactic level when I'm at work when I will bring it into group therapy and um, the understanding and um, I also um, um, have the book that you had mentioned. Um, oh, his name is right on the tip of my tongue. Um, and I have brought in some of these um, ideas into speaking with the patients. And the, just the very gist of it, um, and I think globally and overall, is it's, it's viewed in a sense that mindfulness is a little bit more than emptying your, your head. Like meditation is getting to that calm place and letting everything go, <laughs> calm down. And so it's been a real struggle for me um, to be able to help transcend that understanding, to help make our sessions beneficial. Um, and when I've given some examples, you know, and my background goes much deeper into um, dependent origination and emptiness. And so when you think of um, dependent origination, it, it almost lessens the grip on assigning accountability for pain or for hurt or for discursive thoughts mm. because everything is dependent on something else. And so in it, in it of its own merit, it's, well, I don't want to get too deep, but that's why I, I see such a stark difference. Um, my, my training in, Mahayana Buddhism and understanding of meditation along those lines, Mahamudra meditation, Vipassana meditation. It's, um, yeah, there, you can reach shamatha, you can reach calm abiding, um, but you also can reach insight and Vipassana. And, but that's not really, well, but anyway, that, that was the area that was really grabbing my attention earlier and so I just I really appreciate, you know, you bringing your, uh, your database of all these ideas and things. And so um, it's been enjoyable to listen. So this really wanted to make more of a comment than, um, but, oh, okay. So one thing that did pop up was when you talked about um, the, um, um, I'm trying to go back to the way you had described it, and I'm sorry, I can't do that. But I, I, I thought about Bikram yoga and how he took advantage of his students. And it's very common, I think, in almost any realm, even uh, inherent in a child learning or anybody learning, that when you learn something new, you're like open, your heart is open to learning, your mind is open, and you almost can visualize uh, the instructor as opposed to the instruction, because um, we're taught to not depend on the instructor, but to um, put more emphasis on the instruction, on the message, as opposed to the messenger or the teacher. To, uh, don't be dependent on the teacher, but be dependent on the teaching, put more uh, credibility in that. And so I think that that's a, um, a, uh, a um, quicksand puddle that, you know, every human, is bound to get close to or fall in when they learn something new. And so I think that they're, yeah. So when you were talking about that, that was another thing that came to mind was uh, just an example of, of how um, we do. We have to um, try to be aware of um, our intentions. Yeah. Uh, Mirtz, do you have any comment that you want to make? Mirtz? No, uh, I think I, I just, um, I think I missed the part where she, where Tamara talks about the work she is developing in Brazil. Uh, I'm Brazilian and I 
I think I, when I arrived, you were already talking about it. Yeah, you know, she didn't really get into it in detail, so we'll have to uh -huh. have Tamara okay. back another time. And, okay. And we'll talk about it, because I don't think yeah. she addressed it at all. Go ahead, Tamara. I can, I can send the links. I, where, which city are you in, um, Mirtas? João Pessoa, Paraíba. It's very far. Ah, okay. North, north, northeast. Okay, so the, the, I can send I can send Skip the name, but his, his name is Vitor Podeus, and he's working in Rio, and he has a lot of send Skip some links, and and maybe you can have a, a little look at his work. It's really incredible. Some in English, mostly in Portuguese. Uh, working with street theater, psychosis, collective healing, mixed models, also with this um, spiritist traditions and. Uh, Candamble, yes. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Very nice. Mm -hmm. And uh, Deborah uh, came in uh, late. I, I, I've been coming to Joss last because she's the psychiatrist in the group, so usually she could tell us how crazy we are. But, <laughs> but, but <laughs> Deborah, I give you a chance to talk no. here. Hi, Deborah. Hi. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry I was so late. I got caught up with a client on another Zoom meeting. She's in Scotland. She's an author. So I'm a writer, editor, but also a psychologist uh, and very creative. Uh, you name it, if it's creative, I do it. Okay, from music to, 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 to writing to to dancing to yeah dancing and right now I have no legs but anyway I apologize I really wanted to hear this which is why I came on so late because uh, I had just finished up and I'm glad I caught the tail end of it um, I I did want to ask uh, Skip something or or Kim may be able or want anybody may be able to answer this what he read from the um, um, uh, the lady who, who wrote the comment in which was just an ama amazing comment but it was my, it's my understanding and correct me if I'm wrong that um, for eons uh, Mary Magdalene was portrayed as the prostitute and they even wondered if she was the prostitute who, who washed Jesus's feet um, it's been in the past decade or the past five years, that it was unearthed that the original Old Greek, which is the closest language to what the uh, books of the Bible were originally written in, which you know was was some sort of Sumerian or something. But the Old Old Greek, when they took the words that were written out for Mary Magdalene, which called her a prostitute um, or a fallen woman, well, however, that they had the interpretation wrong. Has anyone else heard or seen any verification of this? That it really yes, that's, someone right, that's right, Deborah. That, that is correct. So she was and not a prostitute, but yet that old, and Tim was, was both Tamara and Tim were so um, right about these old, old issues that have been around for since pre-Middle Ages, and yet women still have that in in the workplace, you know, pushed at them. Um, yeah. I personally, um, I'm different, but I came up the ranks of the military as a civilian, but as essential personnel. And therefore, I worked and operated and lived in a man's world in many times as a civilian, which of course, you know, SGSs are so put down by active duty. Um, but, but, <laughs> but when you're essential personnel, you have to prove yourself every day. And I had to do that. I mean, I'm tell, basically telling colonels and generals what what must be done when it comes to how something should be written and the and the technology? Uh, I mean, I'm the person who wrote the 
Ah, I'm the person who wrote the weapon systems reports for the United States of America for 35 years. That's what I did. I was a publications control officer, the largest Army Major Command, Army Materiel Command uh, in Virginia. And I traveled extensively to wherever they needed me. And it was quite a talk about the yin yang thing, uh, Tamara. Um, I was in a man's world and I was basically um, tell, telling these officers what to do. And at first they totally shunned me until their publications and their reports, well, the one that went before Congress, I thought would go before Congress with just the director of, of the countermine counterintrusion department. And he surprised me at the tail end. Uh, he took me with him. And it was an amazing experience. But you have to fight for it, ladies every single day. I had to prove myself every day. I mean, also, I mean, I'm in my 30s when this is going on. I mean, this is 30 years ago. Uh, but I mean, basically, I served up until uh, I was debriefed in January of 2019. Um, and so I know all about the war colleges you're talking about, Skip, because I wrote all those publications. I was also the person who was head of the message center at AMC, and I sent out the orders to the ships. I sent out the orders to the troops in the field. I see someone waving her hand there. Did you do this type of stuff too? Ah, hi, Deborah. Nice to hi. meet you here. Can you nice hear me, guys? You. Okay, so yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, I'm fixing a a piece of apparatus at the moment. So I'm ta I've taken myself off the screen while I do that. But uh, um, yeah, of course I did, uh, Deborah, is the answer to your question. Yeah, go, yeah. yeah so, uh, go Marie, yeah. I would like to agree with Deborah regarding the stereotype of Mary Magdalene, because in the Nag Hammadi codices, is that the one you're talking about? Yes. Yes, it is. Exactly. Yeah. The, in the Nag Hammadi Codices, I read that book. I mean, not in, ti in entirety. There was a Gospel of Mary Magdalene. Yes, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. Yes, I own it. <laughs> it's, my, it's my Bible, <laughs> of which okay. I have many. So Mary Magdalene it was a sponsor of Jesus's... Uh, um, what do you call this? You know, what? whenever they go and preach, she is the sponsor. Yes. Because she, Mary Magdalene is a businesswoman. Mm -hmm. So all these Jesus' uh, trips, and she financed all of this. So mm. uh, she is not a prostitute, but I don't know why it came out in the Bible. But in reality, I mean, not in reality, according to the Nag Hammadi codices, it says that she is she's in sponsoring the lodging, the food, the trips of the 12 disciples and Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. There's so a wonderful okay. book. I, I, Could I, I, just... I, must, I must interject okay. here because Tamara has to leave uh, very soon here. And uh, we can, after she does leave, we can continue a little bit, but uh we we uh, need to let me just mention tomorrow that i would like you to come back and talk about this phrase that you used early on and that phrase was our healing journey okay and many of us have talked about healing uh but in the context of one-offs okay and the way you said it earlier it sounds like you from your perspective it's we have to always be healing ourselves psychologically so I, i'm not asking you to respond to that at the moment but I, I it's a question it's an open question that i'd really like to address and um yeah, so I, I i'm sorry to interrupt about the mary magdalene part but because of tomorrow's time uh, I, I'd really Sorry. like to ask Kushbu to uh, offer her mantra, if you will. Kushbu, are you available? And, uh, yes, 
And, and J- Jocelyn, I'm sorry we didn't get to dialogue. I'm, I'm, you know, maybe another time. And I definitely would, you know, keen to come back and stay in contact. It's so rich. I mean, the Mary Magdalene topic, awesome, you know. Okay. <laughs> I, so much Tamara, let me ask you this. Would you like to come back next Tuesday and continue the discussion? Because we have open time next Tuesday. Let me check the timing of it. If you, if I can send, if I can check the timing of it, then I'm. Yeah, let me see. Okay, or otherwise. What time we'll is it your again. time? Uh, well, we'd like to try to change it to uh, six p.m. your time to start as a start time. Um, six p.m. Would... is currently available. Actually, yeah, I can block that Tuesday. Yeah, next for sure. Tuesday. Okay. Next Tuesday, 6 p.m. That's the 28th, yeah? Yeah, rather than cut everybody short, <clears throat> let's all go back to uh, Mary Magdalene and, and these other issues next week. Is that all right with you, Tim? Okay. Um, and uh, that will be two hours later for Joss, so she won't have to get up at 5 a.m. to oh. to start uh so and and also for Marie, <laughs> Marie and uh, Nancy won't have to get get on at eight a.m. It'll be a little bit later in the West Coast. So, Kushbu um, out. Uh, well, Kushbu has told me that she she will come anytime. Kushbu uh, has. Yeah, said. I'm just ending up with my conference call, so uh, on the panel. So uh, I. So what time okay. would that be for us? Uh, for us, it's 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern time. Huh. On Tuesday. Right. Yeah, Tuesday, 28th. Yeah, great. Right. Okay. So wonderful. That means that we have uh, next week <laughs> full. <laughs> and uh, uh, so Kushbu, can you uh, see us out? Uh, We pray for well-being of all the people of the world and we pray for the well-being of all the world. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you so much, Kushbu. Yeah. Thank you. And, uh, thank, you. thank you, Tamara. We will see you next Tuesday. That'll be great. And before, if you can join us, uh, that would be I terrific. Okay, Bye, peace. Everybody. Thank you so much, organizers, Tim, yep. Skip, everybody. Thank you for your contributions, your questions. Yeah. Thank Take you. care. Bye-bye. See you Tuesday. Bye-bye. <laughs>